I'm Gloria Palmer. I'm your host this evening. I'm also the executive director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. We're a local nonprofit that offers lectures and workshops and cooking classes um, year-round for adults for enrichment. And um, Ian is one of our regular chefs in our cooking class. He's also our special guest uh, chef tonight. <laughs> Ian, what are you going to be making tonight? Uh, hi, Gloria. How are you doing? Good. Um, tonight I brought a whole bunch of different um, mise en place, the French say. It's uh, everything in its place, lots of ingredients, some of which I uh, foraged myself in the woods, wild mushrooms. Uh, some are some really lovely ingredients from the local farmer's market, some cultivated mushrooms, some, some chicken, some onions and shallots, all kinds of really good healthy stuff, uh, nearly all of it locally sourced. And with those things, I'm going to be preparing a traditional country French dish called Coco Van. <laughs> and uh, the family would, would uh, wring the rooster's neck, and, <laughs> uh, and usually it was an older bird, uh, they, and they'd bring, they'd bring the rooster in and um, braise, braise the bird because it's an older bird and it needs a braising technique which uh, renders the, the meat much more succulent. It breaks down the connective tissues, uh, so we're going to be braising it uh, in red wine, uh, burgundy wine, traditionally Pinot Noir is, w is what is used. So with a braise, you're using a combination method of, of, of heat, uh, dry heat, and um, a wet method. So we're starting with saute. And in, in French cooking, there are uh, whew, seven different uh, dry cooking methods, and saute being one of them. And some people say, well, that, you know, there's oil in there. That, that, wouldn't that be a, a wet method? Well, it's really not. Um, you need to have uh, H2O in, with your, your wet cooking method. So we're going to start with the saute. And what's going to, uh, what we want to accomplish is, a nice uh, caramelization, a nice browning effect that, that's going to enhance the, uh, the flavors of the dish. Okay, so the oil that I'm going to be using is rendered bacon fat, or lardons, or pancetta, you can use something like that. Some bacon fat, and that's, you know, for flavor. I'm going to cut that with some olive oil. You can usually tell when your pan's ready because your oil dances around uh, a little bit there. So some of you might be looking at the chicken and say, why is it purple? <laughs> <laughs> Very odd looking. It soaks in burgundy wine. And this soaked overnight. Okay, so I acquired the chicken from the local farmer's market. I broke it down. I soaked it in the, the Pinot Noir uh, burgundy wine and uh, brought it out, about out of the wine about 30 minutes ago, pat it dry. You know, if there's a lot of excess moisture on it from the wine, it's going to spurt up all, all over the place, and we don't want that and make a mess or burn you. So nice and dry, nice color, hot pan. Let's see how I do here. You should get a nice sizzle. We're going to go skin side down. Perfect. Now, I usually start on a, a higher flame and then lower it down. Okay. So you're using dark meat, right? I am using dark meat, yes. And traditionally, a whole bird was used, okay? And I wasn't sure which way to go with this, um, but these days it seems like dark meat is used more frequently. It's, it's, it's just it's more rich. Um, and, you know, the breast, uh, I'm going to save for another dish. Uh, you know, I'm going to braise this, and it's going to be very tender and delish. So basically, this is half a chicken. Mm -hmm. All right. So the other half is at home, and I'll bread it up and make Parmesan or, or something fun like that. So we're going to brown for, depending on how high your heat is, but if it's appropriate, it should take at least two or three minutes per side. Okay. Now, I'm also going to be cooking in the pan um, carrots from the local farmer's market, shallots from the farmer's market, um, a little garlic, some onions, and notice that you know, I don't put it, everything in at the same time. Uh, well, each thing sort of cooks at different rates, depending on how large it is uh, or you know, how dense it is, essentially. Okay. Nice color. 
Okay. And when you folks are, are eating tonight, you'll, you'll notice uh, the, the rich color of, of this dish. But, uh, it really is a neat sort of purplish brown. Get some good carrots from the local farmer's market. I, I uh, have peeled them. I don't need to demo that. Um, and what I did from there was slice them in half and then make bias cuts. You really can't mess this up, guys. Okay? You, you, you could cut it into, into squares if you wanted. It doesn't matter. They're carrots. Okay? Um, but I, I went with a, a little more surface area on it just, just to... I, I like angles in, in the food. I, you know, I like some, some texture in there, so that's why they're, they're cut that way. Um, I got some shallots. And shallots are sort of like a, a small red onion. I think we're good here. And I don't want my oil to really be smoking. Now the chicken is not done, folks. Absolutely not. We're still gonna braise it. I'm just getting uh, flavor. All right, there's some, some fond at the bottom of this, and that's just kind of the, the caramelization at, at the bottom, and that's good flavor. I'm just gonna leave that right in there. And then in with the carrots. Good to be active with the, the pan when you're sauteing. Definition of saute is a little fat, high heat. Um, this uses a little more fat than your average saute. Uh, it almost approaches a, a, a pan fry, but um, we're cooking a lot of different products in it, so that, that's why. It's not just a dab of oil, it's, it's a bit more than that. So while the carrots are going, cooking away, they'll just be a few minutes. So for the shallots, I've already taken the top and the bottom off and peeled them, and I'm just I'm going to cut them in half. Again, no rhyme or reason here, you guys. Um, cut them as large or small as you like. I'm, I'm going to kind of do slices with mine. I think this is airing before uh, Valentine's Day, so if there's any bachelors out there and they, they have a young lady or, or a young lady who would like to impress her man, um, this would be a fun dish. I think I'll start with the cultivated oyster mushrooms. And these are fresh? These are fresh. These are from the uh, Dorset Farmer's Market. Um, really nice couple own a business there and they cultivate all, all kinds of cool mushroom uh, products and, and this is a good one. Okay, and all I'm doing here, literally, these are nice. I'm just kind of pulling them apart. Now, what kind of mushroom is this? These are oysters. Oysters, okay. Yeah, these are a gray oyster. They're delicious. Nice texture, much different texture than, say, like, like a, a, a portobello. And I've decided I need a little bit more fat in my pan. Just a little. And are you going to use these other mushrooms here as well? I am. So meanwhile, while these are getting some flavor, I have some water in the back that is um, nearly to a boil, and I'm going to reconstitute three different types of wild mushrooms. Uh, the food that, that I preserve in the freeze dryer is, is, the company says is good for like 25 years. So I, I've got all kinds of you know cool mushrooms and, and uh, you know things like mason jars uh, stored at my house that I use for something like this or uh, maybe a, a guest chef appearance or at a restaurant or um, and I sell them at the uh, farmers market. Okay, so water's come to a boil. I'm going to turn it off. Golden chanterelles. I'm going to put in. This year was amazing for chanterelle. Um, I found them from, usually they come out in, in mid-July. Uh, this year it was early August into like mid-September. Um, and the, my, my one patch that, 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 I, that I went to, um, there were thousands and thousands and thousands in it. It was, mm. it was unbelievable. So I'm just, I just, just barely dropped those in the water. These are called Hen of the Wood, my cocky mushroom, mm. is what the Japanese call them. 
Um, they're prolific. They grow under uh, old dying oak trees, and they can be like beach ball size. Okay, um, these are one of my favorites, and I'm just going to crack these up. A few pieces there. I'm not really cooking these. I, I'm just I'm just reconstituting them. Okay. Flat trumpets. These are phenomenal. The uh, the flavor, the aroma. Each mushroom carries a slightly different essence and aroma. Um, I like to say that these are kind of a mild, musty strawberry. Um, really interesting. Yeah. So, some of these are going to go in here. Black trumpets are one of my favorites. So I don't know if you are aware, but Ian has also led some mushroom foraging classes for Green Mountain Academy. Um, they've been a lot of fun. Um, we're planning this summer to do quite a bit more, um, right? <laughs> we better be. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Um, no, yeah, for sure. For sure we are. I, um, I'm hoping to do, well, last year I think we did a, a half a dozen. Yeah. And this year we want to do more. Yep. And they're, uh, okay, so, so my, my mushrooms are looking good. Okay. I haven't seasoned any of this stuff yet, but I, I will shortly. Um, so yeah, we, we meet up in, uh, it's been Merck Forest where we've been going, and, and I, I qualify a little bit so I don't seem like some, some crazy person taking, let's go find some wild mushrooms. Uh, <laughs> so we talk for a little bit, and, and I, I start with safety, a little, little more oil. Um, and we talk about how we're going to find mushrooms, and where we're going to go, and what trees we're looking for, and, and, and we go, and it's, it's, it's just like I'm doing my own thing with some friends. And, and uh, we always find something, always, always find something to take home. Edible mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms, um, fun stuff. So these guys here, you can see that they're, they're, they're still a bit moist. And I'm actually just going to kind of push the, the liquid out of it. It does smell good. Yep. <laughs> These are good mushrooms. So what got, what got you into mushroom foraging? Well, when I was in my mid-20s going to culinary school, my, my stepdad um, gave me a really great uh, North American guide to, uh, a field guide to uh, mushrooms by uh, the National Audubon Society. And I, I, I was intrigued, so I just, through the years, slowly learned. I found some mentors and I learned more. And All right, we're almost done. Um, I'm going to brown my, my onions here. These are pearl onions and I almost wasn't going to use these, you guys, because you can't always find them and you can always get them frozen, but I didn't want frozen. I wanted fresh. And they're kind of a pain to peel because they're, they're little teeny tiny things. My wife was sweet enough to, to do it for me when we were prepping for the show. Um, I almost went with all shallots, but I couldn't get my hands on enough. Uh, or small, like red onions or, or yellow onions, uh, because that's kind of what you usually bump into. You, you can't always find these. Any, any onions will work. All right. So if you didn't have these, it's not, it's not going to ruin the dish. Not at all. I think I needed a bigger plate here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Now, now this is French cooking, so you know I know the bacon fat and, and a little butter. Um, what I want to do here is make a roux. Um, and I found out earlier that someone in the audience was inquiring as to whether or not this dish was going to be gluten free. And um, I decided to alter the recipe because of that. Because in my own cooking uh, that I bring to farmer's markets, I bring lots of gluten-free products. Mm -hmm. So easy. How, how, do you, how do you fix that um, when you're using you know, wheat flour in your recipe? 
well, I use oat flour. It works well. I, I made, uh, it just so happened that what I prepped for the whole audience was already this flour. And so I said, you know what? I'll really make it my, mm -hmm. the recipe mine, because uh, you know, I made some alterations, and I'm gonna use oat flour. And it's, it's almost completely absent uh, from gluten. So it's a very, very good, healthy, uh, complex flour. So roux is what I'm going for right here. And roux is about 50-50 flour and fat, okay? You could experiment if you wanted and, and play with the coconut flour, or rice flour, or you know, different things like that. Um, and by weight, it's 50-50 is a good ratio, okay? And you want, texture-wise, you're going for a look about like wet sand, okay? And if it's, if it's too dry, then add a little more fat. If it's too wet, then add a little more, more flour. And for about a cup, cup and a half of sauce, you want about an, an ounce of roux. So tablespoon, tablespoon, that's, there's an ounce. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna mix in a little bit of tomato paste. And some of the recipes that I found had tomato paste. Some of them didn't, and I decided to go with it. I don't usually mix it with my roux, but I tried it and it came out great. And so let's, let's see how it goes. And if you've got, you know, yumminess down on the bottom of the, of the pan, some of that fond is what the French call it, um, scrape it off. Good stuff. And what kind of wine did you use again? This is what? Pinot Noir. Okay. All right. Now with roux, you either want to use hot roux and cold liquid, or hot liquid and cold roux, uh, so that it doesn't get uh, clumpy. Okay. And I'm just gonna put a little bit in here. This is the one I really want. <laughs> it doesn't come to its full thickness until it comes back to a boil. All right? And if I put this whole thing in there, it's going to be all chunks of roux. All right? So that's why I'm doing a little bit at a time. And it almost looks like a, a paste. So that's a cup of wine? A cup, cup of liquid? About a cup and a half, and uh, a half. of wine. And yeah, you know what? A cup. A cup is good. That's plenty. I'm also going to use some chicken stock. Okay. All right. And this is homemade chicken stock. As I broke the chickens down yesterday, I, I used the, the, uh, the, the backs, actually, um, and made a stock with celery, carrots, onion, garlic, um, a few different herbs and spices. About a half a cup of chicken stock in there. I'm going to get my chicken down in here and... Now, most of my mushrooms I'm going to hang on to because do, mu do mushrooms take as long to cook as like chicken? They're, they're pretty much done. So I'm going to get everything mixed in here pretty well. Some black pepper. I don't know. Eighth of a teaspoon. Uh, just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I usually use about four to one uh, salt to, to pepper. Probably a, a, a half of a teaspoon of, of kosher salt is what I've, I've used here. We're gonna put some fresh thyme in with it. All right, and feel free to break the thyme up a little bit if you like. So lid, oven, my recommendation is gonna be 275 to 300, an hour to an hour and a half. And what I have is a little trusty biometallic stem thermometer, a little, little chef guide that I can poke in into my, my chicken meat here. And dark meat needs to be 180 degrees to be sure that any uh, salmonella that, that, that could be 
have tainted the meat uh, is, is killed. Mm. Okay, so dark meat, 180 degrees. So when it comes out of the oven, when it, after the braise, that's what I'm looking for, 180 degrees. Breast meat is 165. The one I, I, that I just put in the oven, I'm, I'm at the stage, but an hour and a half later. Okay, so I, I'm, at, I'm at the finishing stage. And this is when I would add the rest of my mushrooms in. Okay. If you like, uh, if, if uh, a little liqueur uh, is uh, something that you enjoy, a little cognac or, or brandy to, to finish it up. Okay, I put in only a tablespoon, maybe two tablespoons. And what's going to happen with this is I'll cover it up, go back in another 15 or 20 minutes, it's done. All right, mashed potatoes on my base. Let's use a couple pieces here, why not? Mm. Yeah, looks nice. Oh, it's looking good. Yeah, it looks good. Look at these wild mushrooms, wow. Okay, my onions here. This is just like delish, yummy on a plate, you guys. Hey, this is harder than it looks, you guys. <laughs> so everybody's all quiet, like, what's he going to do? OK, so I guess we're going to take um, just a, a few minutes to kind of clean up here. Yes. And then we'll be back um, with dessert. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm going to show you now how to make a really delicious dessert. Um, this is one of my favorites, profiteroles um, or, or cream puffs. Um, so. We'll start first with uh, making the puff pastry. Uh, let's see, we've got a cup of water that we're going to try to bring to a boil here um, with one stick of butter. How many ounces is that in, in a stick, Gloria? Um, it is, what, a half a cup? So what is half that? Half a cup, in? what's that, four ounces? Four ounces? Wow. Yeah. Okay, so we need yeah. to get that melted. So. Yep. Um, in the meantime, I do have a chocolate ganache that, is, that I made um, yesterday. Um, and that has um, some semi-sweet chocolate, mm -hmm. um, heavy cream, and some brandy in there. Yummy. And that's going to be our topping. So that's warming up here. Now, is this in a double broiler that we have going um, on? That's, that is a makeshift double boiler. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> two, yeah. pot, two pots Just together. Just one slightly larger yeah. than the yeah. other. Yeah. Nice. So we want to melt the butter. Um, we also want to add a um, eighth of a teaspoon of salt. And, and again, I used um, kosher salt. Then we have, uh, let's see, one cup of flour. I'm not, I'm not by any means a um, pa professional pastry chef. I'm just a home baker who loves desserts. <laughs> okay, so I threw all of the um, flour into the pot and I'm going to, while it's still heating, vigorously stir this. And what we want it to do is sort of uh, come together and form a ball of dough. So it's kind of coming together here. I just want it to sort of come together here and form. Come. And that's pretty much what it needs to look like. Then it has to cool for about 10 minutes. So what we're going to do now is add the egg one at a time. And this takes some muscle to mix the egg all in. So with each um, addition of an egg, you're going to want to mix this in pretty well. Um, what I've done, a lot of times for my, the profiteroles I make at home, I usually do ice cream um, inside the pastry. Um, for t today, I decided to go with a um, whipped cream base, but I added 
um, raspberry jam to it. So it's, it's a raspberry whipped cream, uh, which I think came out really nice. This is the utensil I use, and it, I bought it at um, Vermont Kitchen Supply, um, one of my favorite kitchen stores, and actually a sponsor of Green Mountain Academy's culinary series. And how much do you think that is there, Gloria? An, I an ounce? think it, yeah, it's a little. Two tablespoons? Yeah, about mm -hmm. an ounce. Yeah. So this should make about um, 12, this mixture should make about 12 um, puff pastry. And what I do is I just put this on a baking sheet. No parchment? I did not use parchment. Okay. Um, I do use a cooking spray. So then um, these will bake in the oven for about 35 minutes at 400 degrees. What we do then is um, we take the puff pastry, cut it in half, and you can see how um, nice and fla yeah. flaky that is yeah, in there. Nice. So Thank here you. I have um, one that's partially assembled. Um, there is the inside, there's the um, raspberry whipped cream. What we want to do is then just drizzle some chocolate ganache on that. I just want to dip the whole thing in. Yeah. <laughs> Those look great. That looks great. Lots of sauce. Yeah. Beautiful. And voila, you have profiteroles. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, welcome back everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, we had a few audience questions that we're going to go ahead and answer here before we get cleaned up. And uh, the first one uh, was concerning different types of onions. What's the difference between a yellow onion and a red onion and a shallot and a leek? Um, they're not too different in my opinion. Some chefs are really, you know, they got to have their shallots no matter what because they, they're more mild uh, or they're leeks. Um, other chefs, they're, 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 they're going to caramelize their, their product anyway, and it doesn't matter, and it goes in a big stew or soup. Um, so I think for something more, more delicate, go with a shallot or a leek. Sure. Okay. Yes. I had a, a question about my profiteroles um, and the whipped cream uh, filling. Um, basically, what I did was um, sort of a traditional whipped cream um, to begin with, two cups of heavy cream and a quarter cup of confectioner sugar was thrown in there. I've seen some recipes where you can add um, vanilla extract. I didn't, I didn't do that for this um, recipe, but what I did do is I've put a whole jar of um, raspberry preserves in it, and there's a little bit of sweetness already in there, and I think it, I think it added a nice um, flavor, not too overpowering, um, and a little bit of color to the, to the recipe as well, so. This, I had a lot of fun with this. I had fun. Uh, great. Yeah. And um, thank you for being here at uh, Jeanette's uh, dinner party, and I hope to see you at the next one. Thank you so much.